This video covers symbolization of conjunctions. We'll give the answers to all the following sentences which are in the packet. The first sentence says the beer was warm, flat, and bitter, but at least it contained alcohol. This is a very simple sentence which is just, well, I think I can write a little better than that, which is just a string of sentences combined with ampersands. The beer was warm and the beer was flat and the beer was bitter. Now but we have seen is just a synonym for and so in fact at the end it's just and it contained alcohol. This is a string of ampersands and we've seen that when you have a string of ampersands parentheses are actually optional so the easiest thing to do is to leave them out. If you wanted to you could put them like that and then you could put another set like that or I suppose it won't hurt me to point out that you could alternatively do it W and F ampersand B you know, group all of these things in the front together and then put the A at the end. In some senses you might say that this corresponds more closely to the sentence itself but either, either of the, these are perfectly identical in terms of their logical significance therefore any of these answers are fine as is the answer without ampersands at all. Okay, number two, although I enjoyed the story, it was both disturbing and perplexing. This again is just a string of ampersands. E ampersand D ampersand P. The important thing here is that the word although is a synonym for and and it places an ampersand at the comma. Although, though, even though, and while all work this way and they're some of the most, careless, most common careless mistakes I see on the early tests. So E and D and P and parentheses are optional. Of course we also know that the order of the letters is completely irrelevant. The ampersand is commutative and so you can arrange these things in any order you like. Same for the first sentence. Number three. Given that your kids like macaroni and cheese, they should also try fettuccine alfredo and lasagna. Now given that is a synonym for if. So this whole sentence is an if-then. There's an understood then here at the comma. Then commas are always helpful. Some cases they imply an ampersand as they did up above working with an although. Here there's an if at the front and so this comma is actually an implied then, so we have an arrow as our main connective. Oftentimes starting with the main connective is a great thing to do. Now the antecedent of the sentence is that your kids like macaroni and cheese, so if that's the case they should also try fettuccine alfredo and lasagna. This is actually a very simple sentence. Part of the reason it's here is to point out this and right here. How come I didn't capitalize both macaroni and cheese and end up in the front with M ampersand C? Well notice macaroni and cheese is really a single item. This and is not combining two separate sentences. I don't want to say your kids like macaroni and your kids like cheese. No, I like they like macaroni and cheese. I like to call this a culinary and. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's doing work in the kitchen. It's not doing logical work per se. All right, small issue. Fourth sentence. While it's true that if you eat the jello you'll be happy, you'll be dismayed if you try the pudding. What's the main connective of this sentence? The while at the front, just like the although up above, is working with the comma way back here to place an ampersand. And that ampersand is going to be the main connective because it's working with the comma. And the commas are always going to give you the main break when there's just one of them. And so the sentence that's in front is, it's true that if you eat jello you'll be happy. It's true that this is just kind of like a spacer. It's not doing any work at all. If you eat the jello you'll be happy. So that's J arrow H and then on the back side we get you'll be dismayed if you try the pudding. Ah, well it's if you try the pudding so that means we've got P arrow D. So if you eat the jelly you'll be happy and if you try the pudding then you'll be dismayed. There's the symbolization. Well, I hope these first four are very straightforward. Now let's go on to the next ones. 
So these next three sentences um, are also pretty straightforward. Let's see what they look like. A college education leads to a better job and a higher salary. However, one should care about more than money. Is it obvious what the main connective is? Well, notice there are two commas, but they're both working together to sort of bracket this however. Why do we have long-winded words like however and moreover and nevertheless as synonyms for and? I think they're long intentionally so that they kind of call attention to themselves. They create a pause in the sentence. When you have words like that, they are almost always the main connective for the sentence. So however is the main connective, and and is the main connective is always a good thing because nothing ever needs to jump from one side to the other. So in front of it, we've got college leads to better job and higher salary. Well, we know that what that means is if you go to college, then you'll get a better job and a higher salary. We hope that's true, right? Um, and then on the back side, all it is is one should care about more than money. Well, that's just a single simple sentence. So on the back side, we have that. Am I done at this point? Well, of course not. We said the ampersand should be the main connective, so it should be the only thing left outside of parentheses. We want to put a set of parentheses like that. So conditional on the front, simple sentence on the back, ampersand is the main connective. And yes, of course, this is the ampersand is commutative, so if you put the M first and you put all of that on the other side, you're welcome to do that. People oftentimes ask me that about this particular question. It seems to me that that's kind of a sign of overthinking something. Um, this is an ampersand. It's a hard break in the center of the sentence. You don't need to worry about flipping things from one side to the other. Six, if the logicians win the competition, the poets will be angry, but the mathematicians will be heartbroken. All right, now I like this sentence. It's not especially difficult, but it's the type of thing I see a lot of mistakes on. It says, if the logicians win the competition, there's an understood then at this comma. The poets will be angry, but the mathematicians will be heartbroken. So but, of course, is an and, and the mathematicians will be heartbroken. So those are all the correct symbols. We have to put the parentheses in the right place. Notice that the commas are not helping us here. These are both appropriate commas, and since there's two of them, they're making it slightly confusing. Do we want the parentheses around L arrow P in the front, or do we want to put L arrow P and M and put the parentheses on the back? Well, here it really is, you have to stop and think about the sentence and ask yourself, what does it say depends on what? If the logicians win the competition, the poets will be angry, but the mathematicians will be heartbroken. Notice it's obvious that what happens to the poets, their anger is definitely dependent on what the logicians do. And so we want to definitely have P as a consequent of L. But if you think about it, why is it that the mathematicians are going to be heartbroken? Well, it's the same reason. It's a consequent of what the logicians do. So this is definitely the correct symbolization. Now, again, I see that people make a lot of mistakes about this. This is a case where you just have to stop and think about what the sentence is saying, and then you have to get to the, posi to the point where you can read the symbols back to yourself and really understand what they're saying and how it relates to the original sentence. Okay, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. This, of course, is a famous song. It's Leslie Gore, 1963. If everything goes well, I will pause now. And it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. It's my party and I'll cry if I want to. What is the symbolization? Well, there's one comma by an and. So that definitely suggests, well, we should make that and the main connective. And what's in front of it? It's my party. What's after it? I'll cry if I want to. What follows if is the antecedent. So that looks like if I want to, then I'll cry. This is definitely the correct symbolization given the way that this sentence is written on the page. So if this was on a test, this is how you'd want to symbolize it. However, you know the song. Why is it that she can cry? 
it seems pretty clear to me that she would say, well, the reason that she can cry is it's because her party and she wants to. So I think if you were actually just listening to the song, you would have to say that this is the appropriate symbolization that goes with the intent of the song. You might say that maybe I haven't written this sentence correctly on the, on the page. Maybe I shouldn't have put that comma there. If I hadn't put the comma there, I think the sentence would be somewhat ambiguous and you could make arguments either direction. The truth is, I wouldn't put a sentence like this on the test because I think that it is somewhat problematic. It's somewhat ambiguous, and on the test, I generally tests, I generally like to put sentences that follow our rules pretty closely. But I don't want you to have the false impression that every sentence in English just kind of naturally fits into logic. You know, when you get jobs in the real world doing symbolization, you'll have to make hard choices like this. Yes, that, that's one of my favorite jokes. All right, uh, let's on to the next group. Sentences 8 and 9 are longer sentences where it really is worthwhile to take the time to rewrite them, reducing them to the capital letters, the logical words, and the punctuation. If I do this, I would write the following. This says P and A if R comma and now nevertheless that's a long-winded and so let's just drop it there inside parentheses inside commas the conference will be entertaining so E comma provided that that's an if Zeno talks about time and motion, so that's T and M. You'll notice this really is kind of a mouthful. It's a bit of a mess. In a long sentence like this, there are a variety of places to start. One, if you see any really obvious parentheses, that's not a bad place to begin. And you know, if we start it that way, we might say, well, look, this P and A, that clearly goes together. Try to fix up my A a bit here. That's P and A, and Plato and Aristotle will stay home. Well, that, that's just clearly a little chunk there. And on the back side, there's also a chunk that clearly time and motion are going together in that way. Now a good step is to ask yourself, well, can I determine the main connective for the entire sentence? And notice that there are three commas in here, so that's not helping us out a lot. But here we have the word nevertheless bracketed by commas, and long-winded synonyms like this for and, they're virtually always the main connective. And in fact, that's the case here. So you can kind of tell this superficially because we've got this, what you might say, rule of thumb, long-winded synonyms for and typically become main connectives. But if you also just read the sentence and sort of think about what it says, you would see that it divides into two parts. Plato and Aristotle will stay home if it's raining. Pause. Nevertheless, now we get to the next idea. The conference will be entertaining, provided that Zeno talks about time and motion. So this sentence is really just a, a big, this, I'm sorry, this and in the middle is just a dramatic pause separating two completely different sentences. And that's always great news, because now we have a project on this side, and we have another project on this side. So how do we symbolize P and A if R? Well, that should be easy. What follows if is the antecedent. So, R, arrow, P, ampersand, A. And then on the back side, E of T and M. Well, what follows if is the antecedent? T and M, arrow, E. Am I done at this point? No, I'm definitely not this is so important and I see this mistake made so often I think people get excited and say oh great I've seen the whole thing but then they forget to go back and put in these sets of parentheses if we leave out any of these parentheses we have a mistake because we want that ampersand to be the main connective so it has to be the only thing left outside of the parentheses all right there's the symbolization Next one is similar, maybe a little trickier. It says, when it rains, it pours. Let's, let's rewrite it. 
when means if. So if R P. You might immediately notice that when it rains it pours means if it rains then it pours. So there's kind of like a little bitty understood then in between these things. If R then P and when he sleeps, he snores. Well, that's kind of just a repetition of the same thing. If S, then N. It doesn't show up here, but there should be an underline underneath that N. Pretty sure it's in the packet, um, because we don't want to have two S's if we can avoid it. If R, then P, and if S, then N, comma, but, and of course, but means and, so we'll put and, if, you listen very carefully, you can hear the subtle whirring and clicking of the machinery of existence. So if L, and you'll notice that there's another implied then right here, if L, then W and C. Well, once again, this thing really is a mouthful. Notice the comma, there's only one this time, and it's being extremely helpful, and it is saying this but is the main connective for the entire sentence. How do you know it's this but and it's not the when at the front working with this comma? Well, typically, if there's a logical word sitting right at the comma, then that word is going to be the main connective for the whole sentence. If you go back and you look, when the word at the front works with a comma, then there's not typically a different logical word right here. Um, but also, you could read the whole sentence and you say, that there would be a dramatic pause here, and that pause is breaking the whole sentence into two pieces. It's the whole, the overall sentence doesn't say when something happens, then all of the rest of this stuff happens. Sometimes it's easier to understand this than it is to talk about it. I, I hope I'm not uh, saying more than is useful. So let's symbolize this. Uh, the, we know that this and which means this but right here is the main connective. And is main connective always great news? What goes in front of it? Well, we've got if R, then P. And then we have if S, then N. And notice this and is really just conjoining this two chunks. If R, then P, and if S, then N. And so we're going to put R, then P, and S, then N. And then on the back, we're going to have if L, then W and C. And we'll put that in parentheses. Am I done at this point? No, I'm not. Because if you look inside these parentheses right here, we have an arrow and an ampersand at the same level, unseparated by parentheses. That's a problem. We know that we need to have parentheses around that. Am I done at this point? Well, you might say, oh, no, I'm not, because I've got two ands completely outside parentheses. However, I could stop at this point, because this is really just like having A and B and C, and it just so happens that each of the three parts have got their own internal complexity, but this really just is a string of ampersands. Nonetheless, um, I, it's quite natural to put in another set of parentheses like that, so that we show that this ampersand is really the main connective for the entire formula. Okay, so I, I, I hope you can see that things are beginning to get a little complicated, but that if you slow down, break it into chunks, that in the end it makes sense and it's not too terribly difficult. One more sentence. This last sentence has a diamond in front of it in the packet, and it's, uh, it's an interesting sentence. It says, we're pleased that you're coming, semicolon. Well, semicolon is always an ampersand, so it's basically saying, we're pleased that you're coming, and now it says, let us know the date, and we'll schedule a tour. It looks for all the world like that would be D ampersand S, and now you're done. Let us know you're coming. Oh, I'm sorry, we're pleased that you're coming, let us know the date, we'll schedule a tour. Just a string of ampersands. But in fact, this and is really, in, in this case, it seems to be implying an if-then relationship. Because what does the sentence really mean? It says, 
we are pleased that you're coming. And if you let us know the date, then we'll schedule a tour. And of course, since that's an arrow, then you need the parentheses. So this is wrong. This one is correct. This is hideously bad news. How does the word and sit between two simple sentences like this, and yet we end up seeing that it needs to be symbolized by an arrow? I think things like this are quite surprising. Um, I will make a big deal about this in class in a, in a couple of weeks, but here's the thing to think about. Imagine that you were going to program a computer and in, that did symbolization. What sort of rule would you give the symbolization, the computer, so that it could recognize that the word and would need to be symbolized by an arrow? I mean, what is it that's going on in this sentence that we are recognizing that lets us see that it needs to be symbolized with an arrow? These are especially deep and difficult questions to answer, but you know, this is the philosophical aspect of the material, and it's something I find very interesting. All right, so I hope you have the sense that the ampersand's pretty friendly, and, 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 we say and a lot, don't we? And thank you for listening.